Hello and welcome to Arise News. You're watching the Global Business Report. I'm Rotu Sodiri coming to you from Nigeria's commercial capital, Lagos. We're having a special discussion on Nigeria's revenue and debt issues with uh, Ben Akabweze, who is the Director General of the Budget Office, Federal Republic of Nigeria. He's also the uh, former Commissioner uh, for Economic Planning for Lagos State. So we're going to get right into this conversation uh, on Nigeria's revenue issues. First off, starting off with the federal government having suspended the proposed excise duty on telecommunications services. Minister of Communications and Digital Economy Isa Pantami disclosed this during the inauguration of the Presidential Committee on Excise Duty for the Digital Economy Sector in Abuja. According to the minister, the telecommunications sector is already overburdened by excessive and multiple taxation. The federal government, through the Budget Office of the Federation, had earlier revealed that it would begin the implementation of its proposed excise duties on telecommunications services and beverages in 2023. Here's the minister. We apologize to the operators. We know the situation. But from our government side, we will try to address many more challenges to reduce the cost of production so that you will be able to get at least small profit. It is because of this, of recent, it was announced that some of our respected brothers and sisters among the government officials kick-started a process of uh, introducing excise duty in the telecommunication sector, in which there and then, based on the provision of the Constitution of Nigeria 1999 as amended section 147 and 148, being the representative of President Buhari in the sector, I rejected that. It is because of this Mr. President has immediately approved my prayers. Number one, the immediate suspension of excise duty in the digital economy sector. <laughs> and number two, he approved that a committee to be constituted to look into the matter carefully and advise him accordingly. All right, on the other side of the coin, uh, Zainab Ahmed, the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, has of course asked that the planned uh, telecommunication tax on calls and data be put into effect. The uh, Finance Act, of course, 2020, was cited as a tax enabling law by the minister in a statement uh, made by Special Advisor on Media Tanko Abdullahi in Abuja. Now, of course, as we know, Dr. Issa Fantami, he's on the other side of the coin and of course says that that tax uh, is already coming at a time when the sector has been uh, overburdened. So let's bring in our uh, special guest, uh, Ben Akabweze, who, of course, is the Director General of the uh, Budget Office for the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Good morning, sir. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. A whole lot of issues to discuss. So I first of all want to start on that. Um, I think I have an inclination of where you fall, but I want to get your thoughts on this tax um, and this, this, this revenue clash that we're having between the ministers. Well, I mean, I, I'm sure that um, this is a matter that uh, will be resolved in due course. But let me say something. I mean, I, I'm a member of the fiscal policy, uh, you know, the tax policy review committee, which includes members of the private sector. In fact, the majority of its members are from the private sector. And we deliberated extensively on this thing, this matter, before we arrived at including this in the finance uh, you know, a bill, uh, you know, for 2020. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we looked at at that time, as of, you know, four years ago, at least 21 countries in Africa had excise taxes on, you know, on telecom services. In practically, in fact, in all of these countries also, they had, you know, VAT rates that were, you know, uh, on the average, at least double the, the VAT rate for Nigeria. There are extensive studies on this subject about the taxation of telecommunication companies in Africa and other developing countries by the world. And kind of, and various studies, all you have to do is Google and you'll find it. I assure you that the average effective tax rate, which is called the AETR, on telecommunications you know, in Nigeria is below the African average. There are several countries in Africa where the AETR on telecommunications is over 90%, which is what is giving rise to the concerns that in some places they may you know, currently be overtaxed, but certainly not in Nigeria. Again, on this continent as of today, 
you know, we have the lowest, you know, the, the lowest uh, tax to GDP ratio. And so uh, at a time when we, are, we face, you know, existential revenue uh, challenges, I, I think that um, we all need to be, you know, uh, really uh, circumspect about what views that we take uh, on this matter. This wasn't something that Ministry of Finance woke up and introduced. The finance bill went through the Federal Executive Council. It went to the National Assembly as an executive bill from Mr. President. There were public hearings. At the end of the day, they passed it into law. It was signed into law. Uh, you know, we were engaging with customs and um, you know, NCC on, about implementation. And then uh, I remember you know, the, 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 the uh, you know, chief executive of NCC saying that in accordance with their procedures, they would like to have you know, an engagement with uh, their industry practitioners on this you know, to discuss the modalities for implementation. And that was the last I heard before all of this controversy broke. But I'm sure that uh, you know, it's something that um, uh, government would um, resolve in due course. Thank you so much uh, for that. So, okay, if they're suspending this now, the question now is where does the money come from in, in terms of revenue? And I want us to get into a discussion on revenue. In fact, we, we talked about this on uh, the morning show this morning. Well, well Rotus, first yeah, of all, ahead, let me ahead. say, I, I, don't, I don't know about the, you know, the, you know in terms of the suspension. Okay. I mean, uh, the, this is law now. So uh, I, I haven't, beyond what I've read in the media, we haven't been advised about the suspension. Okay. So, for instance, recently, the uh, Federal Executive Council passed the medium-term expenditure framework for 2023 and 2025. That, that uh, framework, fiscal framework that the uh, Federal Executive Council passed includes you know, uh, projections for this tax. That framework is currently before the National Assembly. You know, uh, you know, over the last uh, two weeks, the Finance Committee of the National Assembly has been uh, holding um, you know, engagements with uh, agencies of government on this. So uh, when we get, if we, if we are formally advised that this is no longer applicable, then we will have to rework the medium-term expenditure framework. What that means is, of course, that um, uh, you know, revenues will, 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 you know, will, the projected revenues will decline and the deficits will increase, which means that we either have to cut back on expenditure or increase uh, you know, debt. So I, I just thought to you know, make this, clarify this. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. So I, I do want to get into this, uh, the, the revenue conversation now um, with respect to, and I want to throw this to you because uh, our sister publication, This Day Newspaper, had an interview with uh, Zainab Ahmed back in November 2021, where she said, and she reiterated a point she had made earlier that Nigeria doesn't have a, a debt problem, it has a, a revenue problem. So I, I guess I wanted to throw that to you in light of what's going on now. It, where, uh, is it more complicated than that? Does Nigeria have a revenue problem or a debt problem, or is it more... Is it more complex than that? Or both? Well, I mean, essentially, okay, what she said, and, and, and you know, and I, 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 by that statement, what she said when she said it, was we have a serious revenue problem, which if we do not address, will snowball into, you know, a full-blown, you know, debt, you know, uh, you know uh, problem. Why uh, do we characterize the problem you know, that way? When you look at all the other indices of debt sustainability, our debt looks okay until you get to the matter of debt service to revenue, the relationship between you know, debt service and our revenues. That's where you know, we look really bad and where we are testing limits of sustainability. And so the, the cry was, look, we need to address this revenue problem and to do so quickly, because if we do not, then we will actually be faced with a real debt, you know, debt uh, crisis. Why are we not resorting to cutting back expenditure? Today, our public expenditure to GDP ratio in Nigeria is the lowest you know, on the continent. And among, you know, practically all developing countries except, you know, the failed states. 
So we are not in a place where government is spending too much money. We are in the place where actually government is not spending enough, and that's why the social sectors, health, education, and so, you know, social protection are not adequately. Not to talk of the deficits in infrastructure, and so um, you know, cutting back on expenditure is not a sustainable you know uh, solution because it has long, medium to long term effects. So we need to focus on revenues where, again, as we've said, when you look at our revenue to GDP ratio, we're there at the bottom. We do not, we simply put, most countries around the world, government, the principal source of funding for government is taxation and especially personal income taxation. That's not the case with us. We are in a place today where the top one million taxpayers in South Africa Personal income tax I'm talking about, pay more taxes than the entire 40 million thereabouts people who pay tax, personal income tax in Nigeria. And I'm talking about not just that they pay more, multiples more. So these are the things that we, we, we these are the discussions we need to have. And, and, and that's the point that we're making. We need to put the focus on the root cause of the problem. You know, what is manifesting the stress in debt service? The revenue ratio. Those are, you know, those are outcomes. Those are, you know, those are effects. The root cause of the problem is, you know, public revenue. Mm -hmm. and, and so we have a situation where we have sectors that, you know, contribute over 20%, you know, to GDP. But in terms of government revenue, they do not deliver even 1%. These are the things that we need to begin to look, you know, look at. And in our circumstance, it would appear that you know, you know, indirect you know, consumption taxes are the way to go. And that's why, for instance, this telecom, uh, you know, uh, excise tax on telecom is, is, it was, was uh, you, know, uh, 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 you know, adopted as a, you know, as a, a policy initiative. Okay. Fair, fair enough, sir. So I, I, the thing is, I want to talk to you about, about deficit spending and your point about taxes. Now, if we look at the deficit spending in the country, it continues to climb. I think, especially looking at um, 2021 numbers, I think revenue grew by, yeah, so there we are. So, you know, had revenue drive climbing by 9.2%, expenditure 17.4% climb though, and then the deficits at, at last 2021, 7.3 trillion. So, th this is the thing, in terms of revenue, you're saying, using the example of South Africa, where the top 1% are paying multiples more than and the rest of the um, economy. W what is your response to businesses and individuals no, no, in Nigeria who no, say no, that they are said, overtaxed? Uh, what, what about that? What about that? Um, that argument that they are overtaxed already, as we speak in Nigeria. That they're saying businesses and individuals are saying that they are already overtaxed, and there's you know duplication of agencies and so on. What, what's your response to that? Look, uh, my response is, and I, and I often challenge you know, colleagues who say this, or friends who say, look, subject yourself, open yourself up to a tax audit. And if you find that you're, you know, you're overtaxed, you will get ref refunds. And not a single person has taken up that option because they know that that's not the fact. The truth of the matter is that nobody anywhere in the world, nobody likes to pay taxes. People don't like, people don't pay taxes generally because they love to. They pay taxes because you know you know they you know they have to, and um, um, yes, I, I I appreciate the fact that um, we, we we have you know uh, infrastructure challenges that that make individuals and businesses carry you know a lot of burden that you know perhaps you know if, if the situation were better they would not have to, but we we, we may find ourselves in a chicken and egg situation here where government is saying we cannot deliver this infrastructure because we don't have the revenues. And people are saying, well, we would pay because we have to deal with this. But, so how do we move the needle? Ultimately, it is cheaper for all of us collectively if government gets the resources that it requires and fixes those problems. What we all pay, for instance, for power generation, the effective cost of self-generation is far more than any tariff that we could contemplate to guarantee us, you know, uh, you know, available. I mean, you know, uh, you know, consistently available and good quality, 
you know, power. But we all, you know, prefer to deal with it, in the, you know, individually. The thing about taxation is that the more taxes people pay, the more, you know, they hold their government to account. This is a fundamental principle on which modern governance is based. You know, it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's that simple. You know, the more that's a social contract, the, the sovereign has power to tax, but as this, in the exercise of that, sovereign, that uh, power, the sovereign then must also hold itself accountable to the people. And when you look at countries where people pay tax to the point that it actually hurts, they, they, they hold their governments, they hold their governments uh, right. to account. But when you look at countries where government is run by resource rents from natural resources, they, they, you know, governments are not as accountable as governments that are run by well, the taxes of the people. Well said, sir. Okay, I, I also, we, we have to also want to talk a lot about debt here. Um, particularly, um, I think as at uh, Q1 of this year, the budget, of, the debt management office said we're at 41, 41 trillion naira as far as our debt. That does not include ways and means, and that is the financing that's been extended from the central bank um, to the government, and that's been uh, rising, breaches the CBN Act, breaches the Fiscal Responsibility Act. So as we look at these numbers here for ways and means, the overdraft to governments, now at, as of June, nine, almost 20 trillion naira, which is not part of that. What, what, what's your thoughts on how we manage this. There's been talk about securitizing it into a bond. I mean, I don't know who's going to buy the debt. We really want to get your thoughts on this. Well, um, you know, that matter is, 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 is of concern to, to us, fiscal authorities, to government. If you read the uh, medium term uh, expenditure uh, framework and fiscal policy document 2023 to 2025, which is in the public doc domain, we, we speak to that in a section, we address it, and we use this same number of about 20 trillion that you talk about. So it's not something that anybody is sweeping under the carpet. It's a problem that we have to deal with. And in the current circumstance, there isn't a better option than securitizing it. You ask who is going to buy it. Um, I don't know what you mean by who is going to buy it. At the end of the day, it's the federal government's risk. If central bank, central bank is already carrying that obligation, if central bank simply, you know, converts it into a security, that security instrument that he puts out there, that still carries the, the faith and credit of the Republic of Nigeria. And, and um, I think, I don't think that, especially as we're talking about local currency obligations here, that um, that is a matter of great concern to people now in terms of, and again, it depends on the structure the, the whole idea is to then, you know, turn it into a long, really long-term uh, instrument that, uh, uh, where the, the, the burden of, 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 you know, liquidation will be phased out over a long period that will not have any significant uh, um, fiscal, uh, you know, concern for right. government. All right, thank you so much for that. I want to get to the recent presentation of the medium-term expenditure uh, framework and fiscal strategy uh, paper through to 2025 by Minister of Finance. You were seated right next to her. Um, the impact of subsidies, fuel subsidies on uh, Nigeria's budget, where two scenarios were put forward. So here's scenario one. If the um, subsidies are kept for the entire year, we're looking at a, a, a deficit of 12.4 trillion naira. Mind you, we just looked at 2021. That deficit is 7.3. Amount on fuel subsidies would be 6.2 trillion. Now 100 194% of revenue, 5.5% estimate of GDP. That's scenario one, though. I think, I think scenario two is a little, well, I, not much, but the amount spent on subsidies would be 3 trillion. If we kept it up to June 2023, Budget deficit will be 11.3 trillion. So I, I, I would really like to get your thoughts on, I think you've expressed this in the past, the fuel subsidies and the impacts that they're having on, on our fiscal structure. Well, first, I need to just you know, uh, correct the numbers you've been putting out for 2021. For 2021, full year uh, revenues by the fiscal accounts, 6.1 trillion, total expenditure 13 trillion, and the deficit, 6.9 trillion. Just, I just thought to clarify that. All right, all right. But you're right in terms of the numbers. The numbers for 2023, 
you know, yes, we've put it all out there. Uh, you know, the forum that you were talking about was a consultative forum with the public. We've held consultations with uh, others. We've held consultations with the uh, Nigerian Governors Forum on the subject. We've held consultations with the Executive Council. We've held consultations with the leadership of the National Assembly. And, and the, the culmination of all of these, uh, you know, uh, consultations was that we should go with uh, scenario two, which basically envisages that some action will be taken on, on the subsidy, which will limit it to just half of the number that uh, was put out. So, so basically, that's the, the scenario that we're going forward with. Excellent. Uh, but you're right. That results in a significant uh, deficit, which, um, you know, uh, for now, the principal source of funding is uh, debt. But that's why we're having argue, you know, not argue, discussions about other possible sources of uh, financing um, you know, this, uh, this deficit. And, and as we engage with uh, the National Assembly and other, uh, I mean, the, the Nigerian Governors Forum, for instance, has put, off, put forward their own proposals about how you know, that subs the, the, sorry, the, the um, uh, deficit and therefore the resultant uh, debt can be reduced. And so we're taking all of these on board, and these, these uh, consultations. And, um, um, we would, um, you know, come up with a refined uh, document, hopefully by September, when the National Assembly it's, uh, resumes. And we have to bring closure to the medium-term expenditure framework and on the basis of which the, Mr. President will lay a budget for 2023 before the National Assembly. So uh, by then, you, we, we will know. But, but, you know, for sure, it will not get worse. We we hope and and uh, and to see how we can get that deficit number down. All right. Uh, just a follow up on on subsidies. There's been a back and forth between the Comptroller General of Customs and the NMPC uh, with regard to how much fuel is being consumed. And over the weekend, they put out um, a breakdown of how much fuel was imported into the nation. And there was a particular um, uh, part where they said that I think for Q1 2022. Uh, the landing cost, when you add up all the what, uh, cost of uh, fuel coming in plus other fees, it came out to about 462 uh, naira per litre, a quote from uh, Garba uh, Dean uh, Mohammed. Um, I wanted to ask you, as far as if subsidies are to be removed next year, um, is the government on your part, we've been asking the private sector this question, about whose job is it to mentally prepare Nigerians for how much fuel could cost if you take away subsidies. Do you think the government has done an a, a good message or put out the message clearly enough of how much we could be paying for fuel if subsidies are taken out? Well, I mean, you know, the same document that you referenced from NMPC basically put out what the price would be without subsidy. So uh, there have been engagements going on over the last, you know, for over you know uh, two years, and have been and have been part of some of those engagements. There have been engagements going on with labour, with different you know um, you know interest groups on on this matter, and basically seeking to communicate. And that's why even the uh, MTF FSP public consultative forum you you referenced earlier, that's all part of this. As we we put it all out there, we say, look, Nigerians, this is what it's going to cost if we keep this. You know, we have the option of doing something about it and redeploying those resources to other critical areas. But at the end of the day, if, uh, you know, Nigerians, you know, collectively believe that the better way to spend our resources is on the subsidy, I, I don't, that will then be uh, basically left to the, um, the, the, those who have the, the, the powers to make those the, the final call on the matter to do so. Thank you so much uh, for that, sir. All right, um, subsidies aren't the only high expense uh, for government. There's also personnel costs and, and, and of course, we've mentioned uh, debt servicing. I think personnel costs coming in at about 1.2 uh, trillion naira or so, I think, for the first uh, quarter. Then I heard you earlier saying that I think public spending to GDP was pretty low on the African continent. Um, but our, our capital expenditure, I think, at um, 3 trillion or so, to 1.2 trillion, I think, if I got my figures correctly, is being usurped by 
the size of government in terms of uh, the personal costs that we're, that we're seeing. I think capital expenditure is about three trillion or so. I just wanted you to get your thoughts on personnel expenses. The fact that we're doing all this borrowing, but yet a lot is being said about it being going towards paying for salaries, for instance. Um, what's, your, what's your take on that? Is government too bloated and does it need to be slimmed down? Well, first of all, okay, um, the truth is the overall size of government is not over bloated. Government. However, it is true that in some cases, we have too many people in some jobs and we have too few people in other jobs. For instance, we have too, people, too few people in policing. But perhaps we have too many people in some administrative type jobs. So in aggregate, what we need to do is see how to rebalance this mix. But when we took the total number of federal government you know, employees, which is under, well under 1.5 million in the country, relatively speaking, when you compare to other nations, you know, this size, that's not too large a number. As I said, it's, it's the mix that is the problem. And that's why personally, I, I, I don't as concerning as personnel cost is today. The only immediate solution you can have is, you know, to retrench, which government has looked at as a policy option and concluded that that will only worsen the socioeconomic situation at this point in time. So, as I said, the rebalancing is then the option. But that, again, then, you, you know, you will do gradually. So, for instance, we've had, you know, a near sort of embargo on recruitment into certain types of positions in government for the last two years. Whereas, you know, jobs in the security and health sector have had no, no restriction. Every position that is required there, is, you know, is the approval is given to fill them, but certain types of jobs, no. So this is how over time, you, you know, you, you know, you gradually, re, you know, re, you know, rebalance the mix. The other thing to take to notice, when you take the total personnel cost of government, divided by the total number of employees, on a per capita number, what you come to is 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 is, uh, is a number that is, you know, probably at at least about a quarter of what you will see in the average in the private sector. If we're going to address challenges like corruption, you know, productivity in this economy, we need to narrow the gap between public sector and private sector wages. I've spent more of my life in the private, you know, in the private sector before coming to work. It will shock you to know that my salary today is less than the salary I earned 20 years ago as, as a bank CEO. Isn't that inflation? <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> Basically, we, 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 sorry. Is that not inflation? When we are infl isn't, what do we attribute that? If you talk about I'm, salary, no, 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 no. I'm not talking. About, I'm not. I'm, no, no. If, okay. if if I talk about inflation on inflation adjusted basis, yeah. Then I mean, you know, we're, we're, I mean, it's not. There's no basis for comparison. Right. I'm even talking about naira for naira. Okay. You know, so that just gives you an idea of how oh, public sector is are, uh, uh, and so basically, oh, the real. When you look at all of this, it just takes us back to the crux of the matter, inadequate public sector revenues. We fix that problem. The truth is, gov you know, uh, public servants need to be paid far better than this. I mean, it's like the, the ongoing issue about ASU, you know, the, 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 the pay for, 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 for lecturers. I haven't come across anybody in government, you know, officials in government, engage with this process? Who thinks that lecturers are adequately paid? Or who thinks that lecturers should not be paid significantly more? But at the end of the day, the crux of the matter now is, is, is simply the ability to pay. And that's why, you know, this matter has, has you know, has dragged on. Oh, oh, because okay. government has refused to commit to a number that it does not have the ability to pay. So that you're not signing an agreement that is unimplementable, that down the road, becomes the subject and the basis for another strike. So it's not, it's not a debate about you know, whether people should be paid better. So as we talk about this personnel cost issue, I just want to, that's what I thought to unpack this issue so we understand what 
the, you know, uh, the, the real issues are. Okay, and so just to, to bring this matter back again to the subsidies, if you, you mentioned ASU, it's been talked about widely, teacher, teachers not being well paid, government workers you're saying should be well comp better compensated. W wouldn't, I, I, I know this seems so straightforward, but wouldn't it make sense to, uh, if you stop paying fuel subsidies and the trillions that are going there, allocate that money to these causes that you're talking about. Because even the, Zainab Ahmed, the Minister of Finance, said that there would be a 5,000 Naira transport allowance if you took away subsidies that have been taken away back in, in June of this year. So why is no one, is the you know, executive not listening? What, what, why is this not so, you know, so straightforward to reallocate that money to, else, to, other, to other causes? Well, go back even to the media and see what the response, the response was to that her proposal about this, they were, as I said, there have been engagements for more than two years now on the matter of subjects, active engagements, debating these, you know, uh, considering policy options, how to ameliorate. There's no, there's no doubt that when you take out the subsidy or cut back on it, there will be an immediate impact on people. But, you know, and so government has been looking at how do you cushion that effect in the, in the immediate uh, term. In the long term, of course, it's so much better. You know, part of why we, we, we've not seen enough investment in the midstream sector of the oil and gas industry is simply when you have, you know, an industry where price, you know, price is not market uh, uh, driven, people, you know, can't really make investments. People can't fund refinery projects, for instance, on, on project finance basis. You know, so, but when we take out these subsidies and, and redirect them to more productive, you know, uh, you know, use, then we also unlock investment potentials in that sector. 60 years, you know, down the road, after we started producing crude, we should no longer just be a country that exports crude. We should be a country that adds value to things there. Mm. But, you know, so we need investments coming in there. We should be a country that only, by now, only exports refined products, not crude. Gotcha. But you won't see those investments when you keep, you know, these subsidies that distort, you know, basically the, the structure of the markets there. Mm. I, and, I, and create unpredictability for, for investors. Thank you so much. I have to ask you about Amcon, the Asset Management Corporation of Nigeria. Five trillion naira in, in what's being called now toxic uh, assets and the concerns over you know, what to do. So and again, according to what we're, we're seeing in The Guardian, only about 1.4 trillion has been recovered out of that five trillion in about 12 years. Uh, there's also the issue of the funding of Amcon you know, by lev putting a levy on the, on the banks and then the asset quality are, are you concerned about what you know what we're seeing there with those assets and whether or not you know they need to just be written off completely? Well, I'm concerned. First of all, those uh, it's not describing those assets as toxic is not new. That's the, that's the reason why they went to Amcon in the first place. Mm. Okay, but there are debates. You know, there are all kinds of discussions first as to whether or not Amcon overpaid for those assets in the first place given how toxic they were. And uh, yes, this is a matter of serious concern to us in the fiscal, on, the, on the fiscal side. Because if these, you know, uh, uh, doesn't work out these assets and, and pay down these, you know, uh, these, uh, you know the, the, the amount that was invested in securing those assets, that, you know, burden will eventually devolve on the treasury and will be, you know, in, you know in practically put, simply become part of the national debt again that all of us have to pay. And by, by this design, okay, the resources to work down these, these uh, you know, obligations will partly come from contributions levies on the, you know, the industry, the banks. And I think that Amcon should seriously at this point consider raising the level of levies that you know of, of the contributions that banks make and and even if it's on a risk weighted basis so that the banks that contributed significantly to those pool of assets but which are all you know some of which are declaring you know uh mouth-watering profits nowadays should be made to contribute more significantly to working down oh. 
you okay. know, these assets. I, it, I, it, does, it simply doesn't look equitable that the banks will dump their toxic assets on Amcon, which will now become a public burden, and then they're declaring, you know, really, you know, uh, Great profits and, and, and dividends for their own, you know, shareholders. Oh, okay, because actually, so some are saying the bank shouldn't be contributing at all because Amcon was set up by government, and so the funding mechanism should come from elsewhere. You're saying that the bank, sh at least that levy, should. You're saying it should increase that the bank should actually uh, contribute. No. I don't know. The people who are who are saying that either don't understand how these things work, yeah. and I, I don't know which models anywhere in the world they are referencing where the industry doesn't uh, contribute to that, that burden. Amcon was you know, to basically, you know, bail out the, you know, the, the, the sector. And every country needs a strong, you know, uh, you know banking sector, finance sector. And, and, and that's why governments intervene to stop. People often say, hey, why does government spend that much money to bail out the banks? You see, when you look at the average bank's balance sheet, the money that the banks lend out and all of that, you know, the, the, the assets that the banks carry, on the average, maybe you have about 10% thereabouts that is shareholders' money. The rest of it is depositors' funds, monies belonging to the public, including the poor and the rich, the small savers and all of that. That's why governments intervene to save banks. It's not to save the shareholders of the banks. It's not to protect the interests of the shareholders. It is to protect the interest of the banking public. That's saving. Because when you damage you know, confidence in savings, you create long-term damage to that economy. And people don't save. If people don't save, then you know, investments will also not, you know, not uh, occur as they should. And ultimately, if there are no investments, the economy would decline and not grow as you know as it should that's why you know uh, uh, you know governments intervene not for the benefit of the shareholders principally for the benefit of the general public the depositors to, you know so they, they do not lose their funds because the bank goes under depositors lose their money mm. All right. Thank, thank you for that. I, I want to bring up uh, the IMF. There's a headline from uh, that ran in business. Actually, I think it was a cartoon or, uh, a headline where they said that Nigeria. Yeah, here it is. Nigeria inches toward IMF bailouts on mounting debt. And we seem to have spent so much time on debt <laughs> talking here. But then I guess it is what it is. Is this alarmist? Because, or do you think Nigeria will join Ghana, Egypt, Tunisia, Kenya? Zimbabwe, all these other countries, Sri Lanka, all these other countries, Argentina, I could go on and on, all these other countries that are talking to the IMF right now. You think Nigeria joins that queue based on where our debt levels are? Well, essentially, there are two ways countries end up with the IMF. One is voluntary, where they just say, look, IMF, come, we need help. Or when, it gets to, when things get to the grind, where uh, you know, they can't, they simply have absolutely no other option. I don't see Nigeria going to the IMF voluntarily. You know, you know it's, it's a matter, it's, it's a hot potato issue here in Nigeria. Uh, but honest truth is if we don't address you know, our fiscal you know, challenges in a sensible and sustainable manner, we may end up you know, unwillingly with the IMF. We're currently not at that place. Because that's what I talked about when you look at indices of debt sustainability and all of that. When you look at the structure of our debt, it's mostly you know, uh, majority domestic you know, you know, debt, low currency and, and all of that, which gives you a little more flexibility. When you look at the foreign currency debt, you look at their tenors, a lot of it being the, the concessional and you know, multilateral and bilateral debts that are long tenor, uh, you know, the, the really very portion, component of that being the, those from the international capital market, like the euro bonds and, and whatever, where tenors tend to be shorter and, and the impact. But when you look at the quantum of that, it's something that we, so we, we, we're yet at the point of involuntary, but we could well be if, if we do not stop digging. You know, this is it's a maxim that you find yourself in a pit the way to come out is to stop digging mm. and start climbing out. So, uh, and if we continue to fund 
a, you know, regressive deficits, it's tantamount to continuing to dig. If we continue to pass on reasonable opportunities to increase revenues by introducing, uh, you know, taxes, it, it's tantamount to continue digging. Thank you. Thank you so much. If for we that. do not cut, because even though I say we should not cut expenditure in total, we need to get more efficient mm. in, in, in our spending. If we do not do that, again, it is tantamount to continuing to dig. Gotcha. Um, OK, finally, I, and thank you so much for your time today. But I, I do want to get your take on this quote from uh, Chris Ngige, Minister of Labor and uh, Productivity. He was quoted here. I can tell you that this was back in July, I think. I can tell you that Nigeria is broke. There's no money to fund capital projects next year. As you can see, the dollar has been covering about 500 and 600, now above 700. The truth is that there's no money from anywhere. The money that the FAC, Federal uh, Federation Accounts Allocation Committee, has been sharing is money from taxes, customs, and other revenue generating agencies. And I think he continues um, with this quote. He says, the uh, Na National Nigerian Petroleum Company has NNPC Limited no longer remits money to FAC. So the situation calls for patriotism from all Nigerians. The lack of money to fund capital projects would have implications on the capacity to create jobs. If jobs are not created, poverty will increase in the country. What, what, what do you make of his, uh, his comments there? Well, I don't know what aspect of it because most of what he said is factual. If it is um, his, his, his opening line, Nigeria is broke, they're asking me to comment on, well, I mean, uh, that expression is, look, uh, which, you know, you, you know, it's open to different interpretations. But all that I believe is trying to say, and which I have said today, is that we face, you know, severe fiscal challenges, which we need to address. Excellent. Thank you, Sanjos. And to that extent, I agree with him. All right. All right. Yeah. Final question for you, sir. Final, final question. The, the deficit spending for next year, the projections that uh, you and the Minister of Finance put forward in that presentation to the National St Assembly, uh, you mentioned euro bonds. I just wanted to get a quick take. With what we're seeing around the world, the Federal Reserve in the United States raising rates and borrowing becoming more expensive. And I know that a, big, a, larger, a large portion of this will be domestic borrowing. But on the domestic side, sorry, on the euro bonds, is expense, expensive um, rates, or rather the rates going up, increasing the cost of borrowing, one, crowding out the private sector from borrowing domestically, two. Are those concerns of yours heading into 2023? Well, first, for now, uh, the DMO is probably in a better debt management office, a better position to discuss those. It's, it's up their street in terms of the strategies for raising, um, you know, the debt. But as far as I know, uh, the um, euro bond market is not currently uh, one of the options they are looking at for the reasons that you have explained. On the domestic front, there are, of course, the concerns about crowding out the uh, private sector. But <laughs> when we look at the numbers, when we look at the balance sheets of the banks, there isn't any indication that uh, the reason why there's not much more credit to the uh, private sector is because uh, banks, uh, you know, government is uh, issuing, issuing debt. I think it has more to do with uh, the perceived uh, riskiness of of um, you know those debts, which is not surprising when uh, there are challenges in, in, in the economy, mm. multiple fronts as we currently have. Uh, the risk profile for private uh, borrowers generally tends to rise, and, and banks become shy lending. So, if there's anything to that, that's what we need to then address those those matters like the insecurity, the infrastructure challenges and all of that, 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 that make businesses, you know, more risky from the standpoint of lenders. Those are the immediate issues. The, the, the risk of uh, crowding out the private sector is not one that is really, that looms large at the current time. All right. Well, we do thank you for taking the time to talk to us about all the other issues that are looming large on Nigeria's economy. Uh, Mr. Ben Akabwe is a Director General, Budget Office, Federal Republic of Nigeria. Thank you so, so much uh, for taking the time to talk to us on the Global Business Report. Really appreciate it.